Okay, it's preaching time now. Do you ever look back at things you did as a child and then cringe? Um, I was reading what the author was sharing and I have a similar experience so I'll use my experience. I used to love when I was a teenager and feeling so sad about how nobody liked me. And it wasn't that nobody liked me, it was nobody that was pretty liked me, or so I thought. And I used to love to, I think this is why I became such a country fan. Because I used to love to listen to sad songs just so that when you heard that one particular song that was so very your story and you could identify and then the warm tears come down your cheek. You say, that was weird. I know, it's weird. But I used to love to listen to that song so I could cry. Uh, I still remember it. Um, it was uh, a song called Almost Like a Song But Too Sad to Write. Boy, doesn't that just sound like a country song right there? I could lament my profound loneliness and lack of a girlfriend at 12 and 14. I'm so, you know, right now I'll look back and say, no 12, 13, 14 year old should be dating anyway. And God said, or and God's people said, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but as the tears would come, it felt like draining an abscess from my shallow teen soul. Then I got to thinking back at it now. I love that feeling. You say, you love being sad? Well, I did, I guess. Because soon, I would be excited about something. I love that feeling, too. Mm, later, I'd be angry about something. And to be honest, I kind of like that feeling, too. There's something intoxicating about feelings. I love them. I put up a, uh, I put up a little meme uh, during the week. Um, it was in uh, our the book that we're looking at, uh, Mama Bear Apologetics. I don't think it was original with them, but man, you talk about a saying that'll preach. Here's one, you ready? Emotions are like toddlers. They're fun, but you've never put one in charge. And you think about it. Emotions could go anywhere. And they do, you know, you're expressing a lot of stuff and, and, and they have their, their place, but they need to stay in their lane, amen? In the book, Not Passion's Slave, by the way, I love the title of that book. Robert Solomon distinguishes between passions and emotions. Now this is important. And, and kids, I'm gonna be asking you this later, so pay attention. You there? Okay. Passions are the chemical or physical part of our feelings over which we have little control. Passions are the electric response that your brain has. You know how when you get scared and, and all of a sudden your heart starts beating really fast and maybe your, your palms sweat and you feel all tingly? Those aren't emotions. Those are passions, okay? 
that's a physiological response. There are primitive physical components of our feelings like fear, arousal, or anger. But on the other hand, Solomon identifies emotions, here it is now, as a kind of judgment. So, emotions can quickly change regardless of what's going on in the body. One more time, passions are a physical response. Emotions are based on your what? And just use a word, it's a J word. Based on your judgment. Yes, you will have feelings, but where are those feelings coming from? Where are those emotions coming from? Emotions come from judgment. Passions come from a physical response. So, you ever, um, I'll, I'll give you an example of, of the physical response, and then I'll give you an example of, of the judgment, okay? Physical response. Um, I used to love to do something. Kids, you should never, ever, 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 ever do it. So I'll tell you what I did. Now this is back a long time ago. Um, but I used to, um, and, and don't forget, this was, when the ground was flat, and you could see a long ways away. I used to love to go for a walk on the train <laughs> tracks. I love doing that. Take you out into the country and take you away from all the stuff. Uh, sometimes it would take you into where uh, hippies have been living for years. But it was, it was really cool to do that in Grafton. However, the flat terrain made sound travel weird. Now, I'm guessing, because I, I grew up in a train town. Anybody up, uh, anybody grow up close to trains? Okay. So, so, anybody ever walk the tracks? Yep. Okay. So, now again, I don't know how it is out here, but in the Midwest, when you have a big train coming, if you were close to the tracks, before you ever saw the train, the tracks would vibrate. And you could hear the sound. It sounded like this thing. You'd be like, shh, just like that. And then, when it, and then, then you could see the train coming. Usually when the, the tracks are hissing, the train is moving. And you just figure you got a train with the, you know, 100 cars or so um, moving uh, at 70 miles an hour. They're not stopping for you. Okay. So one time, I'm walking along. I'm out in the country. I'm loving it. I'm having a good time. Just me and my thoughts and just walking, enjoying the day, a beautiful day. And I remember hearing, oh, it sounds so cool to hear that train so far in the distance. Whoop, whoop. You know, I'm like, huh, I wonder where that is. <laughs> and, uh, and, I'm, and I'm thinking that, because there were several, because, you know, when, when a train comes up to a road or a bridge, it's supposed to, supposed to beep. So I, I couldn't remember how many beeps it's supposed to beep. I think it's like one or two, or maybe three, but there's a little code that they do. But this time I heard it again. Again, a long ways away, but. And then I heard whoop, 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 whoop. And I'm like, that's weird. And then I heard shh, and I jumped. And the train went. <laughs> And my heart was beating very fast. That was a passion response. 
I didn't decide, oh, I think I'm going to be scared now. My body said, move stupid. <laughs> and I had all of the energy to, I jumped like a frog further than I had ever jumped before. And that train came by. And uh, when the caboose came, the fellow was waving at me. We'll just leave it that way. <laughs> now, let's say you're a peevish preteen. You're waiting for your mom to pick you up at school. Now, I'm not picking on the only pre preteen that we have here. I'm saying, remember if you were one or remember that you will probably become one, a peevish preteen, you're waiting for your mom to pick you up from school. Ten minutes go by, then a half an hour, then a full hour. You're probably fuming at this point. The car comes screeching up, and it's your dad. And he says, quick, get in. Mom has been in an accident. We're going to the hospital. Now, I would bet that your anger toward mom changes, disappears immediately, because your emotion of anger was based on your what? Your judgment. You assumed something, therefore you then took your judgment and chose emotions based on what you thought was the case. That she had forgotten you and the judgment was, how dare she? But with new information, your emotional judgment changed. Now you're worried about your mom. You're feeling panicky, understandable given the circumstance. At first you were upset because of what you thought was true, mom <laughs> forgot me, but then your emotions changed immediately once you discovered the facts. Well-informed emotions can strengthen your grasp on truth. But this is why the Bible gives us the warning. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. Whoso walketh wisely shall be delivered. The uh, title of the message tonight was Emotionalism. Trust your heart, it never lies. And that was a tongue-in-cheek um, thing because your heart will will fool you every once in a while. Emotionalism, let's see. Emotionalism is based on, or basically refers to placing our God-given reasoning, reasoning faculties with emotion. Is something right or wrong? I'm not sure. Hold on, let me see how I feel about it. Where is my heart leading me? Now, how did we get here that we're going to determine truth not based on facts or science or the Bible, but on how I feel? Well, let's think about what we've learned. Remember, modernism says we're going we're gonna to place all our, our faith and trust on what we can measure and see. And then postmodernism says if we can't know everything, because modernism left us short, 
as, as modernism says, we're going we're gonna to place all our trust on everything we can see. And then there were things that we couldn't see that we still needed to know. And then we didn't, we, it wasn't, we weren't able to reduce it down to a formula. So postmodernism comes in and says to the delusion, the masses, well, if we can't know anything, then we don't, uh, if we can't know everything, then we can't know anything. So the modernists threw out authority and divine revelation as sources of knowledge. The postmodernists went one step, step further and threw out human reason and claimed that all truth was subjective. Subjective truth has to do with the what? The subject. And therefore, it has to do with the subject with what I feel. Objective truth ha deals with the what? The object outside of yourself, a constant. Okay. Well, postmodernism says that all truth is subjective, a, pro a product of, of your own perception. At this point, we suspect that these philosophers had an oh stink moment. You ever get one of those oh stink moments where you're thinking things through and you're putting all of your philosophies together and you're feeling pretty proud of yourself and then oh stink. We just threw out all the means of knowing truth altogether. Maybe there was something we overlooked. And guess what comes in? How my heart feels. There's truth! And so emotionalism, that idea where we're circumventing reason based on just how I feel, Um, is the next logical step from postmodernism. Does that make sense? All right. Something I need to clarify right now before we get any further in this talk. This is not a talk against emotion. Jesus even said in worship, those that, those that worship me need to worship in spirit and in truth, meaning there needs to be emotions, the spirit, and truth. The two are friends. They're not exclusive to one another. Are you with me? Okay. Now, emotions can be uh, valuable means of reinforcing truth. But the caveat is absolutely imperative. Our emotions need to be disciplined according to scripture, reason, and reality. Do you remember our story that we just told a little bit ago about the, the peeved preteen, mom didn't come pick her up, she's mad at mom, all of a sudden, oh, she's not mad at mom because she, uh, she gets the whole story because emotion is based on judgment. So if our emotions are disciplined and we make the judgment according to scripture, according to reason, according to reality, they're great reinforcements of the truth. If not, who knows what our emotions will churn out as truth. This is why the Bible says, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? Even though I try desperately to control and inform my emotions with truth, I still have irrational feelings. I feel worthless, not true. I can feel unloved, not true. I can feel like I'm all alone, that's not true. The problem with using our emotions to determine truth is that they first need to be conformed to truth 
in order to tell us anything useful. So those Facebook memes that say, follow your heart, no, don't let your heart lead. Let your heart follow all day long. So we come to church, and we start singing a song, like Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Our brain is saying, oh, I am saved. I know I'm saved. And I know nothing can mess with that salvation. Now my heart, or my brain, now can inform my heart and my emotions. Hey, blessed assurance, you're saved. Jesus is mine. And then I can enjoy the, the emotion that says, Amen, word of God, I'm born again. Why? Because of the truth of the word of God that formed your brain, that informs your emotions, now it locks all together. Does that make sense? The two should be working together. For a compass to work, it needs to be first magnetized. Otherwise, it won't point to true north. Disciplining our emotions with truth is like magnetizing our emotional compass. We follow our emotions, but only after we make sure that our emotional compass is set to scripture. Does that make sense? If our um, motion, the emotions say, let's go north and proceed to walk in all different directions trying to convince everyone else to follow them, instead of disciplining emotions to match reality, they're trying to make reality match their emotions. When they feel scared, they assume that they're in danger. Instead of perceiving the real danger and then feeling scared, they do it opposite. So what happens is emotionalism makes mis mistakes, I'm sorry, emotionalism mistakes feelings for facts. So there's little assurance that those emotion-loaded opinions in, um, are indeed facts unless scripture, reason, and reality are fact-checking them. So, think about this. Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, theft, false witness, blasphemy. Um, it would be wise then to not just let your heart lead. Now, Emotionalism has left reality completely out of the equation. Here's some more examples. Does hell make you uncomfortable? Yeah. Well, you shouldn't feel that emotion. So we'll just turn it into a metaphor. By all means, don't use your DNA or body parts to determine your children's gender. They need to tell you what they feel like. Then you can figure out what gender they are. In birth certificates now, it says male, female, or something like um, not uh, not determined yet, or something, something, some ambiguous thing like that. This is where emotionalism takes us. Now, don't bother me with facts here. You're right. Well, actually. The stated reason to not check either of the one, uh, the two choices is to say wait until a child is old enough to determine that for themselves. What? <laughs> yeah. Huh. Yes. Because emotions are damaging. Let me keep going. Or, or we're going to stall out here. So, 
Um, these all start with an emotion. They make conclusions about reality instead of starting with reality and disciplining emotions so that they follow. Emotions now determine truth. I feel like a woman, therefore I am one. What is a woman? How dare you ask a question like that? I have been told recently in having a factual discussion about Bible truth. How dare you tell me how I should feel? So, what do we do? Well, we need to roar. And we've, we've, uh, we've been doing this. First of all, recognize the message. There are two aspects here of emotionalism. We're going to look at the assumptions of emotionalism first. First assumption. I cannot choose or control my emotions. This is partly true and partly false. We cannot control our what? We can't control our passions, our body's physiological response to situations. We might, however, be the first generation that has broadly accepted the idea that emotions can't be controlled. All civilized societies are built on the assumption that people can and should control themselves, including their emotions. Civilization depends on it. We expect different behavior from adults than from children because children are still learning how to control their emotions. But this thought that we can't help what we feel is wrong. Why? Because emotions are based on judgment. So if you control the judgment calls you make, you can control your emotion. If you are programmed or start to allow yourself to think emotions first and then determine the facts based on how you feel, you've got it backwards. You with me? Okay. Next, and this is huge. And parents and grandparents, this will help you understand the rationale behind a lot of the weird that's out there now. You know, for us, it's easy to, to say, well, I know why it's weird. They're liberal. <laughs> you say, that's, that's why it's weird. Um, that's not a great way to teach a kid. Or to say, I'll tell you why it's weird, because they're heathen. That's also not a good way to teach a kid. Here's something, a, 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 a false assumption. Negative emotions are harmful. Well, think about that for a second. There's limited truth to this. There is very little good that will ever come from things like verbal abuse or clinical depression. But negative emotions are a part of life. Things get weird when you try to eliminate negative emotions from a person's life. The belief that negative emotions are harmful has led to a few things. One, the tremendous emphasis on the importance of self-esteem, which is not necessarily bad. But then, the removal of competition from many children's activities. You know what? There always will be winners and losers. To say, you know, and, and I remember, and I don't think it, this has been on TV uh, in like a very long time. But I'll, I, I, how many folks grew up watching sports, ABC Sports on, on Saturday afternoon? And you see that same poor guy wipe out skiing every week. 
Remember that? Huh? Hurts every time. But you, you, you had two emotions they talked about. The what? The thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. That's part of life. But now they're saying, whoa, we can't have no agony around here. We're not going to keep score. Everybody gets a trophy. Now, what's wrong with that? Because when you get into the workaday world, everybody doesn't get a trophy. There's competition whether you like competition or not. So in an effort to prevent kids from interpreting a loss of competition, uh, a loss of a competition or a game as rejection, you remove competition altogether, everybody gets a trophy, everybody is special, but while our kids' self-esteem may have soared, their self-control has plummeted. Because in order to win at something, you need to be disciplined to get it done. And you want to avoid that agony of defeat, and you want to experience the thrill of victory. So if you're doing a sport, you work hard at it to try to get the one and not the other. That's okay. And the agony of defeat is okay, too, because it teaches you some things. But if you end up sheltering from negative emotions, this is where we get a very fragile um, generation of folks that if you make me sad, you are oppressing me. If I want to identify as a woman, don't make me sad by telling me I have no right to identify myself as a woman, because I'm not a woman. Don't you make me sad. If I want to identify myself as a turnip, <laughs> then your job is to tell me that I'm the nicest turnip you've ever met. Because any negative thing would be bad and it would be your fault and how dare you do that. So that brings us to our next one. We need to change reality to protect emotions. It's the logical conclusion. If one, we can't change our emotions, and two, negative emotions are harmful, then three, we must change whatever is causing the negative emotions so that we can live a healthy life. I feel like a woman. I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. That bothers me. <laughs> it ought to bother you too. Uh, <laughs> But that bothers me. Well, you shouldn't be bothered. Let's do everything possible then to make you a woman. Wait, what? And see, this is where this goes, and it can have some long-term uh, devastating effects. And that's just, that's just one of the areas. So, the other negative thing is the packaging of emotionalism. Now this one is a new word that I've heard a lot in the last five years. Have you ever heard of, I'm being triggered? Don't trigger me. Now. Anytime I hear someone inappropriately using the term trigger, that <laughs> triggers me. <laughs> it used to be, when, when I worked with, um, in the mental health uh, community, you know, before I got here, trigger warnings were a statement 
to alert people in advance to topics or words that might cause them stress. It was originally applied to warnings directed, listen now, to trauma victims who would need to know that an upcoming, discuss an upcoming discussion would cause flashbacks, panic, or anxiety. Let's think about it this way. You have a veteran who saw horrible things in the war. If all of a sudden you, you're, uh, you're going to watch a movie um, that is very realistic to what they experienced, that would trigger them put them back into that PTSD, that sense of panic, that not uh, because of the incredible trauma, it would bring them back to this place of horror where they would be so petrified they couldn't understand that they're not back in the war. You with me? That's what a trigger is. Um, uh, a, uh, well, here's, if, if a puppy or a dog has been beaten, mistreated, and someone raises their hand, might be raise their hand to ask a question, <laughs> but then the, the dog tucks its tail, yips, and runs back into a corner and hides, that's a trigger. You're bringing that poor little dog back to a place of terror. You with me? Now, the term is used way more loosely to refer to material that would cause any kind of uncomfortable feeling. The Bible triggers me. All because of the assumption that negative feelings are supposedly harmful. Another packaging, follow your heart. According to the wisdom of the age, our hearts are the barometer of truth. It's our pesky minds that get in the way. I've actually heard counsel of folks say, listen, turn your mind off and let your heart guide you. And I'm thinking, that explains a lot. Another way to package this. I'm offended. You used a term that I don't like. More and more, we're seeing the world ruled by whether or not someone is, is offended, except when it comes to Christians. Nobody cares about that. But not only will people speak up for their own uh, uh, for their own offense, but they will try to predict what will offend someone else and speak up for that person too. I love it when every once in a while you have an anchor in the Bible, a great piece of they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Stop it. Move on. Okay. So we've recognized the message. Now let's offer discernment. One of the best analogies uh, for understanding the true purpose of emotions is comparing them to warning lights in a car. Now there are two ways that you can respond. The lights are to alert you something is going on that needs to be investigated. So you get a check engine light. What can you do? You can, yeah, and you can ignore it or you can fix it. And some folks fix it by taking a piece of duct tape and putting it over where the light is. There, it's fixed. Or you could smash it so that the light doesn't work. Or you could take it to the mechanic and find out the truth about what's going on. Now, the third one is, takes the most time, the most money, but it's the most effective. So, 
emotionalism by just addressing the negative emotion is like putting a piece of uh, electric tape over the light. There, feel better? Let's look at the lies. Lie number one, <laughs> if I feel it, it's true. I think we've spent a bunch of time on that already. Lie number two, my feelings are your responsibility. I can't help what I'm feeling, so obviously you have to help what I'm feeling. Lie number three, to endure emotional distress, here it is, is to endure injustice. So, if I'm distressed over a name that I'm called, even if it's a correct name like boy or man, but I don't want to be called a man, then you are treating me with injustice. Now think about it. If that goes further, and, and there is, are some le legislations out there that follow this, this thinking, that would say then if somebody does identify um, as somebody who they are not biologically, and you don't recognize them the way they want to be recognized, it's a form of, what do you think they're going to call it? Hate speech. If you don't say they, them, instead of she, her, or he, him, it could be considered hate speech. Hmm. So let's argue for a healthier approach. I'll try to wind this down here. I love the fact that the Bible does give us some anchors. Casting down imagination and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and doing what? Bringing into captivity every thought, read it, every emotion, to the obedience of Christ. God doesn't tell you something to do something you can't do. So as we become more consciously aware of our tendency to jump to emotion-based conclusions, we'll find ourselves on the road to change. The most important step that we can take in the right direction is to become aware of the difference between truth and a truth claim, and then realize a truth claim is that uh, is something that was um, is something that someone claims corresponds to reality, whether it does or it doesn't. Truth is just truth. All right. When it comes to our kids. There are a few important messages that we need to get through clearly. One, we all have emotions. We all have some control over emotions. The Bible tells us to take our thoughts captive. The Bible tells us that we can renew our minds. So therefore, we can do that. Number two, praise emotions when they align with truth. We don't want to raise little robots who are terrified of emotions. That's, that takes us in the wrong direction. So it's essential to help our kids discipline emotions. Untrained emotions can be like dogs that run around and pee on everything, or worse, attack unprovoked. But a well-trained dog, on the other hand, can uh, charge into a burning building and drag out a person to safety. The, and the effects of trained and untrained Emotions are just as dramatic. So then lastly, let's reinforce through discussion, discipleship, and prayer. Teach your kids about emotions. 